Hello everyone, welcome live from Rotterdam. Um, this webinar, Mitigating Critical Financial Risk in Dutch Solar Project Development, here from uh, Solar Plaza office. Welcome on my behalf, my name is Edwin Coates. I'm the CEO and founder of Solar Plaza. And um, we have an interesting program for you with a lot of interactivity. There is a lot of opportunity to ask questions to three um, senior experts in different uh, parts of the value chain in the Netherlands. Um, Leonard Flores so is an independent energy advisor now, but he has a, a huge track record in the solar industry. We'll more about that later. Michel Chatelain, also an enormous track record, more on the legal side, more on, on him later. And Harald Hofeng, uh, a financial expert in the Dutch market and in other markets uh, on behalf of Toyota's uh, bank. Um, we'll have a QA and a um, and then gives you the opportunity to come up with questions. This uh, webinar is provided and offered by you by Solar Plaza, and most of you will know us. I don't want to spend too much time, um, but we have a, a huge track record on in organizing events. You can find more about that on our website. Um, yes, we're going to talk about um, the, uh, the mitigating of risk, and uh, this is a general uh, webinar on the Dutch market specifically. If you want to learn more about our other services like the Solar Plaza Consultancy Group, uh, that we founded this year. Um, there is a the separate website for that. And I made use of the opportunity to do, to do a little promotion for our new uh, sister organization. But get, let's get back to this uh, uh, webinar, which is a prelude to our upcoming conference on the 7th of September in Utrecht, 13th edition of the Solar Future NL. And of course, you can imagine not only um, we, but I also guess a lot of you will be looking forward to a, a live meeting as well, where we can meet uh, with our colleagues and peers in this uh, in this market, in the Dutch market. Um, some practical things, some practical notes. On the side, you see a uh, menu, and there is a chat option and a, and a position where you can post questions. And please bring in and bring on your questions for these experts that will give us uh, and, 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 and lead to an, in, an interactive webinar, because that is the aim for this session. Um, presentations and slides, of the presentation slides and the full recordings will be made available afterwards. You will receive an email for that. So in case you missed part of it or all of it and you want to share it with colleagues, be our guest. Before we enter into the details of our expert speakers, let's do a poll question with you. And please answer this question in the coming five to 10 years. What do you envision as the highest risk for your solar project development built right now? Is that unexpected rise of interest rates or maybe the insurance and damage claims that could um, be happening? Or is there an, an unexpected change in the value of a solar kilowatt hour? Or maybe something um, which you might consider very rare, but happen could happen a PPA going bankrupt. Or is there an other reason why you think other thing that you think is uh, going to be a high risk for your solar, solar project development? So please, the panel is open. Please um, answer these simple questions and we can use this with our, our speakers because it's related to the topics that we're going to discuss in this webinar. I see some uh, results coming in. Okay. And wow, very nice that uh, we see topics that we're going to address today are being very valued as being very important with respect to the financial uh, risk and the mitigation of that. Thanks for participating in this poll. And uh, let's go to the first speaker of today. His name, uh, Leonard Florissen. Welcome, Leonard. Um, uh, Leonard has worked as an, uh, is working as an independent energy advisor has over more than 25 years of experience in the business development and executive roles in Europe and North American energy markets not only in renewables, also in natural gas and power. Uh, past 10 years, you might have known him for being the CEO and founder of Rooftop Energy. Um, and now Leonard has dedicated his uh, uh, dedicated more to the investment and consulting in renewable energy industry. Please welcome Leonard. Hello. Hello. Good to Hi, see you. Hi, Leonard. Good to see you. Um, Maybe as a first introductory question, uh, independent energy advisor. So what kind of companies are you helping right now? Oof, that's uh, quite a broad spectrum, I would say. Um, 
both in terms of companies and uh, and in terms of countries. Um, so I'm working in um, in 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 Europe, but also uh, more recently in in the U.S., uh, where um, solar is uh, um, you know going through a new revival with the Biden administration. Um, and um, in that, um, yeah, it's basically uh, let's say uh, consultancy firms, EPCs, and and also the end customer, uh, which okay. is uh, looking for um, for a project. Yeah. Okay, well, Leonard, we look forward to hearing more of uh, from you. Uh, let's um, please take it away. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Edwin. Thank you very much, uh, everybody on the call, um, for this opportunity to uh, to exchange ideas with you. Uh, always a, a very inspiring, and um, um, we are still doing it on video now, of course. But uh, as Edwin said, we are very much looking forward to see each other. I guess uh, after the uh, after the summer period live. Um, but let's uh, let's do it in this video conference uh, today. Um, the question that, that I got was uh, to uh, talk to you about uh, a subject um, which is really sort of the price or value of, of the kilowatt hour in the coming years. And uh, fortunately, um, we saw just in the small poll that um, the majority of you think is it's an important su uh, subject. So. Um, uh, that is uh, that's quite uh, good to hear because I totally agree with that. I think that's one of the major questions we uh, we are talking about. Um, in in preparing this seminar, we um, uh, we spoke about um, uh, let's say risk to to, uh, to solar projects, and um, I guess you can say that you know risk and risk management or financial risk management for for projects. Um, has also has already quite a tradition and uh, discerns some more traditional, let's say, project risks, such as the credit risk of your customer, uh, risk of cost overruns or, or timing overruns and all that sort of thing. And um, I guess we have quite well-established mechanisms to, um, uh, to, to, to manage that. Um, of course, we can we can we can talk about it uh, as much as uh, you want. It is for you um, uh, participants in this uh, seminar to to say. Um, but I would um, want to um, look ahead, uh, look at something that is maybe starting to become uh, more of an issue. Again, referring to the results of the poll, um, and um, uh, and, and that I think will be uh, an increasing issue in the future, and uh, for which we may not have uh, all the mechanisms, uh, all the, 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 the financial risk management mechanisms in place yet. So it will be a bit of um, development, I guess, over the coming period. And um, when we talk uh, about the price of the kilowatt hour, um, my um, the, the, the title of uh, my contribution is um, and I see one little word is missing, but um, a bit of a paraphrasing of um, Bill Clinton. It is the capacity, stupid. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 and that is really sort of the summary of what, what um, my contribution is. Um, uh, the central idea is the, the price of the kilowatt hour as such. Um, will become less important over time and the price of the kilowatt uh, will be uh, a, a much more dominant factor in the value of our uh, uh, projects. Okay, that is um, the very short summary. So let's move on from this first uh, slide. Um, II3050 is basically a Dutch term. It's uh, the uh, Integrale Infrastructuurverkenningen 2030-2050. This is a document that was produced by um, basically uh, the network operators of the Netherlands uh, in April of this year. Uh, quite a voluminous uh, piece of work. Uh, I think we're talking uh, 200 plus pages, um, but uh, quite an interesting read, uh, I must say. Uh, and um, um, I've taken some material from this, uh, from 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 these Fred Kenningen, from this study. Um, and one of them is um, basically this little table, which is um, the projection of installed capacity in different scenarios um, that we see. This is for 2050, 
Um, so for 2030, uh, which, mind you, you know, is well within the SDE term of most projects, um, it is less than 10 years away, which is uh, in our industry uh, still, uh, you know, a very overseeable uh, period. Uh, in, in 2030, the expectation is that we have 60 gigawatts of installed capacity, of which two thirds is sun, solar, and wind. Um, and the maximum demand on the Dutch system is something like 15, uh, you know, maybe 18 gigawatts um, in total. So we're talking already towards 2030 about a huge overcapacity, production over uh, ca production capacity overcapacity um, in um, in our system. And towards uh, 2050, you see this um, uh, increase even more. Uh, the forecast is that uh, due to um, all the new uh, electricity demand, like electric vehicles, etc., uh, the um, the maximum peak, so the the may rise from 15 today to maybe 30 to 40 in 2050. But even if you take that into account and you look at these scenarios, you see uh, that the um, uh, the the overcapacity uh, is only growing. And um, well, remarkable, I guess, in that respect is uh, the uh, the enormous uh, contribution of solar uh, that's being expected, um, significant contribution of wind, of course, but mind you, also uh, uh, still a quite significant amount of gas-fired generation, which is simply needed uh, to keep the system going, uh, predominantly in, in in times of underproduction. Um, and um, um, this study uh, looking at these um, figures and of course also studies in much more detail concludes that um, if we do not introduce price signals uh, that steer the location of uh, renewable energy production projects uh, that we will get to a much more expensive solution uh, for the whole system than in case we can introduce these sort of price signals. And uh, that is to say, the capacity pricing uh, will become more important and much more dynamic um, than it is today. And that is really the uh, essence of my contribution. Um, um, the, 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 the determination of the value of a, kilo, of a kilowatt hour is um, no longer be, uh, going to be the central idea in our thoughts. The, um, central value driver is going to be uh, capacity and availability of capacity at any moment, be it times of overproduction, when capacity will probably be very pricey, and times of uh, underproduction, when capacity will be very cheap. Um, can we move to the next one, please? Well, of course, we all know, and I just took a recent quote from um, uh, one of the um, uh, magazines uh, that uh, kilowatt hour prices are in any way going down and and keep keep falling we may see uh, short-term changes but I think I think the long-term um, the long-term uh, trend is, is very clearly towards uh, even lower prices now three cents per kilowatt hour is even fairly expensive if you if you compare it to uh, some of the tenders in Portugal which ended up more like uh, around one cent per kilowatt hour uh, price range. So there again, um, the, the 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 price of the kilowatt hour itself, over the calculated, of course, over the over the lifespan of a project, is going down and is becoming uh, extremely low. Uh, the next one, please. This is an interesting study. A think tank in the U.S. Rethink X the. Um, and they did this study for three areas in, in, in the United States, uh, mm -hmm. California, uh, Texas, and also New England, which is, of course, from a meteorological perspective, rather comparable to, to Northwest Europe. And uh, they just conclude that uh, in 2030, um, supplying electricity with 100%, uh, 100 based on purely solar, wind, and batteries is possible uh, in, in all three regions and is the cheapest possible solution uh, to electricity supply by that time. Um, so again, this, this points in the direction of, um, uh, of the fact that this um, 
th these renewable sources will develop and will develop quicker, I think, than any other any projection that we see in the market today. Um, will drive kilowatt hour prices down, but due to the enormous imbalance between the maximum uh, peak demand and, and maximum peak supply, um, capacity is going to take center stage in uh, the value chain. Um, so, conclusion, um, marginal costs of construction are very low. So, building projects and building projects slightly larger than you may need is extremely cheap. Uh, marginal cost of production, of course, once you have it uh, close to zero. So this will create uh, incentives to, uh, to, to build overcapacity and create overcapacity locally, uh, which will make kilowatt hour pricing more or less obsolete. And uh, what we need is capacity pricing signals to um, steer the balance between supply and demand in a dynamic way and to allow all part market participants to uh, participate in this game. Uh, and that says also that we are, are going to move to regionalized markets and no longer the copper plate that exists today. Um, it will be uh, at least uh, from time to time, I think, uh, uh, regionalized something, you know, a phenomenon that, of course, we've seen in North Pool for, um, you know, for, since, since, since the start of humanity, I would say. Um, so, in, in, in effect, uh, uh, not something new, but something that will be also happening to our markets, as far as I can see. Thank you very much. All right, Leonard, thanks. Uh, I think it, uh, this triggers already, uh, hopefully, also the thoughts of our participants. It, in, uh, it already triggered me, in any case, and I guess it can also trigger Harold later on, um, because uh, you're, you're talking about 2030, pretty close. Um, where this, you know, the value of a solar kilowatt hour could already be not as important as the capacity of a project, which means like you have projects now being built with a 15 year uh, SDE uh, that in 2035, definitely the capacity is becoming more important than the kilowatt hours. Uh, so what does it mean for a project developer in now in the Netherlands who's building a project and then later on, we're going to talk with that uh, on that with Harold, of course, if you finance a plant, and you're dependent on a on a pricing system which is unknown at this moment. Yeah, that's that's the central question. And uh, you see that the SDE pricing mechanism has a minimum level for a kilowatt hours, and also um, uh, there's a mechanism in place that uh, at minimum prices over six hours a day, um, there's actually no SDE being paid, and. Um, there is a risk uh, that that is going to happen uh, more and more often um, uh, and and the whole issue of capacity pricing is not even in the SDE system at all. So um, where that will lead us, we can debate that for a long time, whether we need to maybe um, after the fact to redo something about the uh, SDE uh, or, uh, or other changes, that's, uh, that's a very interesting subject of debate. Yeah. So I would uh, kindly um, invite all our participants, if you have questions, please uh, share them in the chat, uh, in the question box, uh, in the menu, so that we can uh, gather those questions and discuss after the next presentation. But thanks so far already, Leonard. Stay tuned. Let's go over to the next uh, speaker. Uh, Michel Chatelain, for many of you probably well known, he is a partner at Corporate and Competition Law at Evershed Sutherland. Um, in the company commercial practice group, uh, over more than 20 years of experience in solar energy industry, advising both national and international clients, as well as governmental bodies and utilities. Um, he has a wide experience in dealing with utility companies, uh, also private companies, public shareholders, and specific complexities around decision-making processes of municipalities. That sounds like a mouthful of a lot of uh, words. Uh, I know he's good in words, he's good in law. Please welcome uh, Michel, uh, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Um, um, I, I think you're also offering your services to private clients, do you? I do. I think uh, that uh, what you just read is uh, to emphasize that we also work for non-private clients because people probably know us from working for private clients most of the time, particularly in this uh, in this industry. Yeah. So you're going to talk about the topic that is uh, being discussed most right now in your practice. Um, well, I I thought it was uh, good to to flag uh, two or three uh, topics basically 
that uh, that we see on a on a daily basis, uh, which is the reality for uh, for developers and and investors in, in solar projects, um, and that people struggle with, and and I think it's uh, those are risks that don't, that will not go away in the near future. So it's uh, I thought it was uh, good to. Uh, to talk about it, of course, uh, being a lawyer, those are things uh, or issues that have a, uh, let's say, a legal background in the sense that it's uh, around um, the question how the law should be applied in particular situations. And uh, uh, since solar industry is a new industry, there are all kinds of new situations that, that were not addressed before. So that, that leads to uh, numerous uh, legal issues and questions, so, uh, which have, been, have not been dealt with before and if that's the case then we as advisor was asked so uh, what what is it going to be is it black or white and then we said well there's no precedent for it so it can be either black or white unless we have clear precedents and and with clear precedents uh, we mean that the supreme court being our highest uh, legal body has given us some direction or the european court for that matter so perhaps we can go to a slide and I can yes, please go, ahead. go to the first uh, issue, which is known to everyone. It's about uh, the, uh, the congestion. You have a little map here, which, which reflects the, uh, I don't know, it's the most actual situation, but the, the situation is pretty much like that in the Netherlands. This is all about access to the grid. Um, in the Netherlands, access to the grid is, is basically uh, divided in two different uh, uh, rights that you get, based on the Energy Act, which is the right to be connected and the right to uh, to have your energy transported. The issues that uh, people are facing at the moment is that grid operators are not giving you access to the grid by refusing to provide you transport capacity or even uh, refusing to, to, uh, to connect you or, or not being able to connect you on a timely basis. Uh, the congestion issue that the debate is around that is, is about what is congestion exactly. I, I'll, I'll just take it from a position where I think uh, it should be about that if we talk about concession we only talk about physical concession so we're not talking about contractual concession which some grid, grid operators used to to put forward but physical concession which is which has a structural nature um, the problem at the moment of course is that we don't as a market party you're, you're not able to to assess whether uh, there is actually a structural issue at a certain part of the grid. You just have to rely on what's being presented. So um, I think the situation at the moment is that there is a lack of transparency in the um, um, uh, in the, in practice, which one can argue whether that's whose fault it is, but that's just a matter of fact, I think. So there's a bit of an imbalance. And another point, because you always deal with monopolists, is that they have to follow this principle of non-discrimination. Everybody should be treated equal. But you also see there that um, you know if you're a smart developer, you have good contacts. It's easier for you to get connected than somebody who's new on the on the uh, on the marketplace. Um, uh, another risk that you see is, of course, that there's not, not enough capacity, another form of capacity. And Elena just mentioned about, but not, not enough capacity within the grid operators to get the work done. So there's this this mandatory 18 weeks realization period is is not met, which in practice uh, uh, can lead to, uh, uh, of course, delays and also to damages. Um, uh, it's something that, you know, if, it, if you take it to court, grid operators are always held accountable. There's no excuse, basically, hardly any excuse possible for them because that's in the law, but of course, they're lobbying to get it out. And the other thing that people face in practice are the first come, first serve policies that are being followed in those places where there is grid congestion. So you, the rankings are being made. It's all un untransparent um, and it's uh, in, in part uh, illegal uh, if you look at the at the court cases that uh, that we have seen. Um, the two, I think, three developments that will may help in the future or should help. One of them is a court case, a Supreme Court case, uh, which is supposed to come out in this month, in the Schenkerfeld case, where um, uh, that's a connection uh, dispute. Uh, that, that transport capacity was not granted, that was asked for. And um, um, in that case, grid operator uh, was not justified in the refusal because he, well, at the, at the, at the time of the refusal, uh, there was no real physical congestion that could not be proven, uh, not even contractual congestion for that matter. 
uh, but of course it went up to court. And what we have in that case is a, at the moment, an opinion of the attorney general, uh, Mr. Dreiber, um, who sets out the, the, the playing field. I think that the Supreme Court is going to follow. And there are two things I think you should uh, take into consideration. First of all, that this principle of uh, access to the grid, that that is a, a legal pr principle which follows from the European directives. And the second one is this principle of non-discrimination, um, which means that this first come and first serve policy uh, is only justified um, in the situation that you have a, a congestion situation. The congestion procedure was followed. Uh, which means that refusal to provide transport is justified and in those cases uh, first come first serve would be justified and no other cases would not be not be justified. Another development important to, to look at is the ACM uh, congestion code I call it that they're uh, working on and will be adjusted to give, give us some clarity and then we also have the new energy act where of course um, um, you know there are lots of lobbying going on behind the screen in order to um, to release uh, from the greater operator's perspective to give them a bit more lenience and from market perspective to avoid that. So we have to see how that will play out. And in, in, in any event, I, I think that transparency will be improved and will, uh, you will get, get some clarity and we will find some, some solution uh, in, in the middle. I have to go to the next issue because otherwise I can't do it. Within the time given to me, we can discuss things uh, later, of course, during the discussion. Another thing that we see is all in the development phase is uh, this resistance of local stakeholders, and that can have uh, you know local stakeholders from from citizens that live there, municipalities, uh, um, uh, trade organizations, uh, around issues like the use of agricultural land. I think um, when we started with the solar plants in the Netherlands, everybody was uh, really enthusiastic, but this enthusiasm has basically followed the development we've seen with wind. People are more skeptical, more critical. And also with regard to the use of land, so there's a lot of there's a movement against it, nuisance for the citizens around, or or uh, uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, ecology, ecology is an interesting point um, uh, because in some cases uh, developers are being asked to to take some um, uh, uh, environmentally friendly measures to, to improve the ecology locally, but what happens if that leads to rare species uh, starting to settle down in those areas on former agricultural land and then at the end of your your project period um, in principle things should be returned back to normal is that still possible if you have some rare species um, breeding on that location uh, another thing that we see is that the appeal procedures have been open not only to direct interested parties uh, but that's a general thing within administrative law but to a wider group of people so the number of people that can actually appeal any kind of permitting that was um, issued by local government is actually widening so that potentially could lead to more litigation um, and then of course it makes it in particular if you are a non-dutch developer you enter this market and and um, we are being asked uh, so what about uh, this local policies then we have to say well we have 500 municipalities so in theory you can have 500 different policies um, that doesn't make things um, easier and, and in some cases there was no policy i think that's changing uh, bit by bit but but still you have to deal with all those local differences and then a final point here is the um, you know the, the the desire or the, the, the to have participation involved based on the climate agreement and all the questions that come with that topic uh, for instance, uh, participation is not all, if you ask people locally, I understand it's not only about financial participation, but just being involved in the whole process of getting a solar plant uh, realized close to your, uh, to your um, uh, location. So how do you mitigate that? I think stakeholder management, that's basically the, the, the key word, uh, how to do it. It's not a legal answer, but um, uh, we can help with it. Because of the time, I think what I just mentioned PPA, I don't think there's, from a legal point of view, there is a lot of risk coming at it, at least not what I can mention, but following up what Lena just said, um, we're still in the SDE market, but if that ends, we expect, uh, of course, more uh, corporate PPAs and virtual PPAs uh, um, uh, becoming relevant also in the Netherlands. And there, the idea is that as an off-taker, you pay a fixed price. Um, and the, um, 
um, you know the differences in the uh, in the market prices are being uh, compensated through a mechanism that you include in a PPA agreement. Um, I'm, I would be curious to hear from Leonard what his thoughts are on that, but we can have to later for the discussion. Um, I think, um, yeah, all the the issues that are listed here on the slide for PPA are just, I think, common uh, topics, which from a, a legislative point of view, uh, I don't have anything particular to add other than that those risks need to be, you need to be aware of it and you need to uh, address them in the particular PPA that you are concluding. So I'll keep it there because of the time we can continue during the discussion. All right, thanks, uh, Michel. Um, some interesting points that you raised, uh, the, the congestion, and just a question from my side uh, before we go to the next speaker. We were talking about congestion, you're also talking about the legal case about that, and but then who has to prove that there is a real congestion? Uh, and, 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 and because there is no congestion police, right? To, and, and to well, give you a fine. Uh, uh, the, the, um... You know, since it, it, we we have, we live with natural monopolies, a grid operator is a monopolist per definition. That means that everybody who needs to deal with it should be protected is in a weaker position. So the burden of proof that there's congestion is with the grid operator. And how they do it in practice is that they uh, have these congestion reports that they issue and they ask an, a third party advisor to to uh, make a technical uh, report, which shows that there is actual congestion in that area. Um, and there's a, some kind of congestion police, one can say, because they, they need to report it to the ACM, uh, our energy regulator. And, and the ACM uh, uh, is actually the one who, super, who should supervise that those reports are actually uh, uh, properly done. Um, These reports are think... public? Sorry? Those repo These yes. reports, are they public? Um, they're, they're not, I think not all the, they should, uh, I think they're not public enough. Uh, because okay. uh, it's from a legal point of view and based on the EU directives um, and also jurisprudence around that, I think as an individual party, you are entitled to receive all the information why on your particular location there is physical congestion and why that prevents the grid operator from uh, providing the capacity that you ask for. So that should be tailored for each individual a party oh, and, okay. and, 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 and that's not what the practice at the moment, but that's what you're right is where people just have to fight for it at the moment, I guess. Okay, thanks. Um, please to the audience, uh, um, share us your questions that we can address later on after we go to the next speaker. And I'm happy to have him here um, from a different uh, angle, looking at uh, look, looking at the financial risks and mitigating these critical risks. Um, we have Harold Holfink, and he's a team manager of energy and climate at Triodos Investment uh, Management. Um, he worked at several Dutch banks and has fulfilled roles in relationship management, structuring management, buyouts, and risk management. But we know uh, Harold, of course, from his renewable energy expertise and uh, background as a project finance in as a member of the project finance team for the Dutch market. And he focused on solar projects um, and now also on heat and cold storage projects in the Netherlands. Welcome, Harold. Thank you. Hi. So, um, Harold, you're going to take it from a different angle. The floor is yours. Yes, okay. Thank you. Um, I think two uh, very interesting angles have been discussed already and will be discussed later on in, uh, in the panel discussion. Um, I wanted to add two more. Uh, items that are on the next slide. Uh, well, that one, yeah. Um, potential changes in the financial world. Uh, maybe not um, all of interest for the existing projects, but for the projects to be developed and to be built uh, in, in future years, this might be really of interest. Um, because one of the important costs um uh, in your daily business for a solar plant of course are the interest rates and the interest rates they are very low at this moment so that helps in the leverage that you can get for a project uh, meaning that only 10 percent or maybe uh, even less uh has to be provided by equity and the rest can be provided by a senior debt but if interest rates raise in the nearby future the upcoming years, 
that might lead to the need to have extra uh, equity involved in the project and less uh, capacity for uh, for that service. Um, with the uncertainties uh, in mind that Leonard mentioned, that might really lead to uh, projects not uh, being realized. And of course, we never know what interest rates will do. I do not have uh, a glass ball on my desk which says which uh, side the interest rates will go. But we see inflation going up uh, at this moment. And if that lasts for a longer period, then it might be that uh, interest rates rise in the upcoming years. Um, second part, what can be of influence of the interest rate is not the market rate, but is also regulations uh, towards banks and other financiers. And if more in, uh, uncertainties come into place in these projects, like subsidies going away, um, power prices being less predictable, um, that might lead to a situation that banks need to have more equity in place for uh, loans being provided to, uh, for instance, solar plants. That's what we see right now in more the brown uh, assets, uh, so the oil uh, and gas assets, where central banks already say to, uh, to the commercial banks that they need to have more equity in place because the projects become more risky. And that might be the case in uh, in the future as well for renewable energy, as uh, the, the the cash flows become more uh, unsecure. And the second part that we already see in the market um, right now um, for rooftop projects is uh, discussions about insurance. Uh, having insurance in place is becoming more and more uh, difficult, uh, especially for rooftop projects. And if the weather conditions in the upcoming years uh, become more unpredictable, because there is more uh, uh, extreme weather coming on, then also for ground mounted projects or floating projects that might lead to more uh, uh, claims uh, coming along for insurance companies and then they might say, well, we are not willing to insure uh, solar plants anymore or not insure all risks or at least at a higher price, which also might affect the, uh, the bankability of projects. Because for a bank, it's very important that uh, a project is uh, properly insured. So that are some potential changes in the financial world in the upcoming years. Um, and then the second part, a little bit more related to the topic that Leonard mentioned, is the curtailment. Um, we already know that from uh, wind energy, um, where curtailment is quite common at this moment. Um, if projects need to be curtailed because there's no demand for, electric, uh, for, for the power produced or the price is very low, then that immediately leads to, to missed income, uh, PPA income, but also uh, subsidy income if it's uh, the price is negative for less than six hours. Um, and that directly affects the, uh, uh, the cash flow of the project, of course. And as soon as um, this uh, occurs, more and more uh, PPA parties will not be willing anymore to provide um, with, with uh, compensation for that. But there are of course several opportunities for this. Uh, I think storage, at, at least the, uh, the possibility to add storage to solar plants becomes more and more important. That can be of course battery, which is the most common way at this moment. But what we see more and more are um, projects that can also deliver power to heat. And the Dutch government has stated that all uh, buildings being built after July 2018 are not connected to the gas grid anymore. 
And in the upcoming years, until 2050, um, the built environment has to be disconnected from at least natural gas for, uh, for the full capacity. And there, power to heat can lead to uh, new chances where you get seasonal storage as well, and you can use the heat during winter time to uh, to heat your uh, your buildings. And the last thing to keep in mind, I think, is the design of a solar plant. A lot of solar plants are being built at this moment south oriented uh, because that's the cheapest way in constructing. But maybe it's more interesting to have a, another design, uh, more east-west oriented, so that production is more stable during daytime, which can help in uh, lowering your peak uh, production exactly during the times that power is uh, for free or even at a negative price, which directly affects to, to uh, the topic that Lane had mentioned. I think that are the two important things that I wanted to mention over here, and uh, maybe we can discuss that uh, in more detail uh, in the panel discussion. All right. Uh, thank you, Harold. Uh, you raised some interesting points, which uh, we're going to address. Uh, I was just uh, uh, just very practical, and I'm not an expert in in several of the point in the areas that have been discussed so far. But I was just wondering. So, if inflation goes up, let's say in the next five years, uh, some financial uh, disaster, or, or, or yeah, inflation goes up to um, let's say five percent. What happens with the, the finance contract that the plan, uh, a plant owner has with uh, Triodos Bank? Well, normally, um, if there's already a contract in place, it doesn't uh, affect the contract uh, immediately because most interest rates are fixed for a longer period, just to prevent for this risk of increasing interest rates. But of course, for contracts to be signed uh, in a later stage when uh, then we will ask for a higher interest rate because our uh, saving clients who provide us with the money that we uh, lend out um, they want a higher reward because their money is uh, becoming worth less every year due to the inflation okay thanks Harold um... And for the audience, please uh, raise your hand to share a question if you have anything for the panel. Um, I see a question coming in from uh, Stefan Pleging about uh, the, the tracking systems. How about solar tracking systems to be installed in the Netherlands instead of the east-west? Uh, this helps producing solar energy over the entire day and also gives the opportunity, opportunity for multiple use of the land for farming, not possible in east-west. Yeah, um, good question. East, uh, so what about tracking systems? Who would like to say something about that? Um, Does anyone have any expertise with that? Yeah, I, I can't say much um, expertise really because I don't think it has been applied much. Um, and the, 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 the uh, cost versus return has not been that favorable necessarily uh, but clearly if you, if you think about an environment in which um, uh, capacity and the moment at which you deliver your power becomes more important um, anything that helps to manage that or to um, uh, spread your production over the day so that you're um, producing more in the hours that uh, power is actually needed uh, may help. So if, if there's any value, I would see it coming from that. Okay. Um, thanks uh, for posing your question, uh, Stefan. Uh, let me inspire you a little bit with some uh, with a doom scenario. Uh, you, you raised some interesting points about what can go wrong or what are the financial risks. So I'll, I'll picture you a scenario in, um, in a five or ten years from now, indeed a kilowatt hour the value is almost zero um, because there is so much solar energy at the same time we see uh, uh, the dso's uh, curtailing your your projects um, regularly actually so you're 
almost not able to sell a decent amount of energy uh, to the grid or to your um, um, yeah on the grid. And at the same time, the inflation has gone up because the financial crisis as a result of the COVID crisis is now hitting us hard. Actually, your complete business case collapses because all of these three reasons, you cannot sell the energy. If you sell it, it's worth nothing. And inflation has gone up. So who's ringing the bell here? Harold, are you gonna call the uh, the asset owner and say, guys, we have to talk. You have to raise your equity stake because you know we cannot finance this plant. You're, there is no generation of money here, revenues. This is not uh, sustainable for us. Yeah, I'm afraid so. I'm afraid I will call uh, Michel as well uh, to ask for his insolvency uh, desk to help us. Um, <laughs> because if, if that doom scenario really uh, occurs, then uh, yeah, we will have uh, serious problems. Um, and then the, the, the uh, yeah, of course, we will discuss potential uh, opportunities with, with the client. Um, and then we should talk about storage. That's why we talk about the possibilities of adding storage in a later stage. Uh, uh, we discussed that already right now with, uh, with clients. Maybe, maybe not for this moment, but at least the possibility to add it to the project. Um, well, then I will be the client and I would say, yeah, I'm not generating revenues. My, 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 yeah. the, it's a disaster. And now you're asking me to invest in additional storage. I don't have the money. So please, Harold, can you also provide me the financing for this extra storage yeah. and, that is required? And, and, and maybe we do so if that helps uh, also for us in getting our money back. Because if the doom scenario that you uh, mentioned really occurs, Edwin, then no one's willing to pay any price for uh, such a solar plant. So we can ask the owner uh, for adding more equity, but they are not obliged to because it's all ring fenced project finance, uh, non recourse. So they are not obliged to to do so. So in the end, they can give us uh, the keys and say, well, okay, we cannot pay your uh, loan anymore. Uh, we are in default. Here are the keys. Good luck with the solar plant. And then we are the proud owner of a lot of beautiful solar panels, but cannot earn any money with it anyway. Um, so then we we will have to find solutions in adding value in the project and uh, preferably we do so together uh, with the project owner because it's not our intention to become that project owner. No. So yeah. when do you start ringing the bell before I go to you, Michel? Uh, because maybe the doom scenario is not happening from one moment at the, uh, at, at the mm -hmm. other. but. Uh, yeah. Of course, you see inflation ri rising, you see more and more cases of curtailment. Uh, so yeah. when are you start ringing the bell? Um, we discuss it in quite an early stage. We always look for it. We update, uh, update every financial model every year based on uh, power prices uh, that are being forecasted. Um, so if we see the power prices going down, um, and we see in the future uh, years, in the, in the years uh, coming, that um, at least debt service capacity levels are not in line anymore. Then we start discussion. Say, well, okay, what's what's going on, on over here? What can we do now? Should we act together? Shouldn't we act? So we start that discussion before a default is coming in. No, Michel, you wanted to add something uh, to this doom scenario discussion. Yeah, I, I, of course. Uh, that's uh, I love doom scenarios because uh, that's basically <laughs> our job to uh, to try to think of doom scenarios when people come to you for uh, for advice. <laughs> a good lawyer should be a little bit uh, paranoia, of course. Um, <laughs> but this, this uh, 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 yeah, I think what, the the way uh, Harold already said it that that's the, the way those projects are structured. It's all non -re non recourse uh, project finance, right? So. As an investor, you know that the risk remains within the SPV, so to say, uh, and that's that's where it ends for you. Um, the lender, the bank, uh, if it's a bank, uh, most of the time it's a bank, will take over. That's how the whole uh, uh, financing structure is is uh, set up uh, with the direct agreements. Uh, because for a bank, it, it's in, in a situation like you just described. It's about I think it's more about uh, reducing your losses rather than. Uh, 
anything else. So and for a bank, of course, it's always uh, it more interesting that the project will continue because it, it will generate some kind of revenue instead of liquidating it uh, because then you have to uh, take your losses uh, immediately. So the banks will be will be become then in in, in the driver's seat, and then it's up to uh, to to Lander and others to come up with uh, smart uh, uh, solutions to to limit those uh, those risks. Yeah. So Lander, the scenario I predicted or I pictured is that a, a doom scenario that is going to happen or might happen in 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 ten or fifteen years from now? What's your uh, well, vision on that? Let, let let me say start with one statement that may sound. Um, a bit more as a joke than it really is, which is, you know, there is no doom scenario in renewable energy. It just doesn't okay. exist. Explain that. It's only good news. And um, no, I mean seriously, the the what is irrelevant. Uh, first of all, if we have rising inflation, normally speaking, we should also have increasing economic activity, meaning more demand, meaning rising electricity prices, and so on. So. Rising inflation doesn't uh, happen in a vacuum, uh, so that that is the first thing I guess to to, to say. And 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 moreover, um, nothing happens in a vacuum. You know, everything is related, and uh, and and that is what we need to face. And what we need to face is that, you know, structurally, you cannot escape the fact that in renewable energy, with shorter operating hours than the traditional power plants, there will be an enormous overcapacity. It at times and under capacity at other times. This is an unescapable fact, certainly in uh, Northwest Europe. And if we, you know, with the cheapest source of of, of useful energy, which is solar, um, we have to feed not only the electricity market, which is only 20% of our primary energy demand, we have to feed the other 80% as well. And that is traction, cars, trains, um, ships, aircraft in the end and we have to feed and that's very dominant in the Dutch market the heating market and the heating market is a seasonal market uh, in in Northwest Europe of course and in other countries it's different but in Northwest Europe it's a seasonal market and the traditional problem of our energy market has been and will be that there is a difference between the moment that you produce the power and the, the moment you need it and so Harold is Quite right that we need to think about the uh, you know the tools to to shift energy over time, and um, we are just I think uh, not necessarily uh, sufficiently recognizing this point already, but we should, and I think there also financiers have a role not just to uh, start talking to project developers at the moment it's too late, but to start to talk about them up front, and if you think about a an environment without subsidy uh, where you rely more on PPAs, I guess, you know, power, all, even from solar, will never be completely free. You know, there is a capital investment to be made and somebody has to take the risk of that investment. That has to be divided between market parties. So uh, the buyer of power, you know, can agree, I think, in a PPA, a price for power a base price, so to speak, with uh, with the project developer. But then on top of that, there will be variable and increasingly more variable capacity costs, and you have to deal with that. So that means for a solar project, if you find a customer close to you, you know, you will not have this problem. If you find a customer far away, you will have this problem, and then you'll have to deal with it. And um, And so that is more from a project level perspective, from a national level perspective, I think we have to think much more actively about the um, uh, this 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 uh, change uh, or the, the relationship between the gas and the power market, for example, to bridge, uh, uh, you know, to serve the heating market with new, with renewable power, uh, because that's I think fundamentally what we need to do, and um, and there uh, you know more action is needed and 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 more room should be made for market initiatives. So actually, what you're saying, if I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that there is not that uh, such there's no high risk from um, prices of, of kilowatt hours going down. Um, it's just that you have to adapt to other opportunities, transforming your electricity into heat, into fuels, into hydrogen, or whatever. You need to be prepared for that, and there is no risk, no financial risk for your power plant 
uh, as long as you diversify actually what your your output um, well as, but, yeah as long as you think through uh, you know what is going to happen and and the um, in in this American study that I showed there's an interesting observation that uh, because of the low costs of additional power uh, you know you you are going to build over capacity it's just too cheap but that over capacity will create pockets of of uh, of oversupply and pockets of oversupply will create new demand if you if you allow the market to work yeah? and uh, and that would be the best mechanism and it's they compare it interestingly to an iphone you know that by the time we were we were walking around with our nokia's uh, uh, we didn't think uh, of all the services that would be possible via telephone but creating the platform uh, it, it creates the services, and I think we will go the same way. Interesting, uh, Michel, or how do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think it's just one thing that the um, we need the markets to be open up, so further to, to be further deregulated eh, to enable these new business models. Uh, as an example, I think if we talk about uh, aggregation of uh, of different sources of production, which then can also reduce the risk of an individual project, of course. Um, that will be made possible soon um, by implement, implementing uh, USB, uh, European legislation, but also, for instance, uh, the over, if there's overcapacity, then storage is very, is an obvious, uh, a obvious solution. But storage, to have a storage facility, which is fed in by different projects, uh, a scalable storage uh, facility that, that, that people are thinking or are already working on. To make that possible, there's some legislative hurdles for, from a tax point of view and, and, and others. So we need to uh, yeah. to get rid of those and we will get rid of those. I'm, I'm sure about that. And then and we don't even talk about blockchain technology that's looking at solar production and breaking apart, uh, uh, you know, the kilowatt hours and the and the uh, the green certificates uh, and so forth and, and uh, to make, it, to enable other revenue models uh, to to come uh, to see light, see the light, and and use to be used in those situations where you need additional revenue because of the risks that we just uh, dis discussed. So I'm I'm quite yeah. optimistic that uh, that we will find some solutions for those uh, challenges. But but let's let's be practical and pragmatic. So I want to build now a 10 or 20 megawatt uh, solar project, ground based. What should I take into account, Lane, at looking forward of looking at your uh, statements? Like, yeah, you should be flexible to adapt to the new situation, and then uh, maybe in 10, 20 years, uh, it's no longer about the value of a kilowatt hour, but on the capacity or on on the possibility to change it, to transfer it into heat or to uh, to fuels. So, how would you take this into account in 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 your design, in your plan design, and in the financing structure of your plant? Because 10, 20 years, this is within the lifetime of your project. This is going to happen for all projects that are being built right now, right? Yep. So what do I need to do um, when I'm starting to design a plant right now? Yeah, um, I would be happy if I could give you all the possible solutions. Uh, for sure, uh, I agree with what I think Michelle is saying, that, that um, you know, the true physical congestion issues in the network are not going to be solved on paper. You know, they are going to be solved by physical countermeasures. In some perspective, and um, one thing you may think about is more than before, maybe to rely on, you know, local demand for your production, and to think more on uh, harmonizing, you know, local production with local demands. Uh, maybe build a smaller project than you would traditionally do on a on a roof, yeah, so that as much as possible of the power you produce can actually be consumed in the building uh, that you're on. And, um, and, and, and I think, you know, government regulators should think about uh, uh, ways to promote this sort of thinking rather than to kill it as it's, I think it's done today. Um, and, um, and, and, and that is just one, I think that is a, a, a very practical example which you can do today and what I think is increasingly being done today is, is thinking that way, you know, uh, link, link your production to local demand. But, well, actually, if you see, if you look at what the market does right now, we're building a lot of projects ground-based in more remote areas where there is no demand. So actually, these plants are have the highest financial risk. Then, Harold, are you looking at those projects? Are you? Well, yes, that's one of the things uh, that we keep in mind. If 
for instance, if you want to um, provide the power to, to heat, uh, power is not uh, regional based eh, normally because the, the grid operators put extra copper in, in, in the ground and you can transport it all over the, uh, the country and abroad. Um, but heat is especially regionally uh, based because you cannot transport it from uh, Groningen to uh, uh, Amsterdam because the loss of heat is uh, too, too much at that moment. So that is one of the things that we, we keep in mind. The other thing, uh, the, the counterpart of it is that um, land lease in the western part of the Netherlands is more expensive because there are uh, a lot more people uh, living over there. So the demand for uh, the, the pieces of uh, land is higher. So that are two um, uh, movements that are uh, contrary to each other. That makes it quite difficult at this moment. But Especially a, since the SDE uh, subsidy that's in place now is based on the cheapest production for this moment. Mm -hmm. So if I could, would come with this 20 megawatt project development idea in the eastern part of Groningen, a uh, remote area, uh, would you as a bank say, look, this business model is quite some financial risk. Uh, did you think about uh, uh, power to heat options in uh, maybe 15 years from now? Because uh, this is going to happen. And so the business case as it, as it is right now, just solely on selling your electricity is, uh, is thin. It's too thin to finance this project. Um... Maybe not to that extent, because we do not know what technologies are available within 15 years. That's the difficult part for us. The market is moving quite rapidly. Um, but uh, yes, we might uh, want to have less risk in the end of the project lifetime yeah, and might not have, want to, to have some uh, merchant risk uh, included in it for those locations. But I, I'm still looking like right now you would still provide me the financing, despite that you don't know if the business case still holds in 15 years from now. And you end uh, up with a portfolio of project in in eastern part of Groningen, which is no value. Or Leonard says it, it still has value, but it's very less, difficult less to value because value. There, there will be solutions within 15 years to still earn money with the project, uh, but maybe less than expected. So then. Power to heat is one uh, solution, but there are several solutions, of course. Yeah. Could this lead also to a regional uh, uh, different tariffs for financing uh, of projects? Maybe in the future. Yeah. I, I, I don't see it right now, but we see it in, uh, in real estate, for instance, where a lot of banks do not want to finance commercial real estate uh, outside Randstad because uh, the risk of uh, not being able to rent it out to, to parties is too large. So that that might occur with uh, renewable energy in future as well, uh, de depending on, on possible solutions in uh, the upcoming uh, five to 10 years. Yeah, Michel, you wanted to add something? Yeah, just on, on that point, uh, I think the, the, the power exchanges, of course, uh, they, they will become uh, more reasonable. So you can have, uh, you know, split ne the Netherlands in a couple of areas and you may have a northern part where prices for uh, electricity will can become different from other parts in the, in the country. I think bring, bringing demand and supply together, what Lena wanted to say, might make one point. I, th I think that the, that the market does works already in that way because First of all, the big projects were realized in the north where the land was the cheapest. Then the grid got, got congested. And what do people do? They look for creative solutions and they start either bringing projects close to where the demand is or setting up uh, closed distribution grids, like a large project where you combine production of solar and perhaps also with wind with, with large scale storage. And you try to also uh, include some, uh, some big off takers in that local uh, environment. And that's some, you know, we, although the whole uh, structure, legislative system, is, as we set it up, was not designed for that purpose, I think we'll go that route uh, out of necessity. And you already see it happening. Okay. 
Um, let's go to a question from the audience. Who can inform the decision makers or the government about what is most likely to happen in order to develop a sustainable plan for them to roll out in means of stimulating the right techniques in power generation for the long term? Um, interesting question from Ben Comport. Um, does anyone, oh. who can oh. answer? Oh. Yeah. Who can inform the decision makers and government about what's most likely to happen on these areas? I think uh, as touched upon by, by Leonard and others um, about this, uh, this, the, the right techniques, stimulating the right techniques uh, in, in, in power generation for the longer term. Yeah, well, like, like the power to heat, like uh, yeah, in hydrogen or in uh, in fuels. Actually, uh, yes, at the moment, of course, you see that like the the, the large development that that is that the government is 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 jumping on actually is is hydrogen. Uh, so, uh, what I understand from from the hydrogen discussion is that people say it's not. Uh, some people believe it will never be uh, competitive. Um, Others say it will become competitive, and I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in the end that if, uh, as a society, you decide to go that way, then then it will happen. And, and just the mere fact that Gasuni has been uh, appointed as the uh, the entity that should prepare our gas grid for for hydrogen transport, I mean that's a very significant uh, development, and at, and that would also resolve a part of the um, uh, capacity issues that Leonard flagged. Uh, where you can have already you see the development we, we're going to use offshore islands that are uh, abandoned for uh, production of, of hydrogen and so at, the, at those peak moments that the wind energy is being produced and not, not needed there's no demand you can uh, transform it into hydro you will tra transform it into hydrogen so who should i think that the yeah I, that there's a big push coming from the eu as always with uh, Timmermans and uh, Diederik Samsung now in the lead. Uh, and then you have the, um, I think the big industry is making, showing their, you know, looking at the future. And they, I think they are behind the push for hydrogen. That's my perception. And then uh, the rest of the, of, of what wants solar and wind energy asking for it because it's, that's a, lot, a natural environment because we want to get rid of fossil fuel. Okay. Um, we have to finish this uh, interesting discussion. We can uh, talk uh, for for longer time, but uh, maybe we save that up for uh, for the next uh, edition of the Solar Future um, in, in the 7th of September in Utrecht, or maybe uh, at some of our other events as shown on the screen. Um, just as a final question, uh, um, you know, we're talking about the mitigating the risks, this this critical financial risk. Um, can you can you just share with me or with the audience one positive trend or one trend that you uh, you think is worth mentioning that is very positive and that could really help in uh, mitigating this critical financial risk? Uh, Lena, you mentioned already something. Maybe you can summarize what what do you think is a very interesting positive trend that will help us mitigate those critical risks? Well, I think that there, there, there are many. I think one one important one to um, to mention, maybe you know, looking just at the market market forces that you uh, uh, observe, is that certainly compared to when uh, when we started rooftop energy ten years ago and now, um, the, the the pressure from end users and clients themselves um, to get truly renewable power uh, from sources on their own roof or or at least from the Netherlands is um, is increasing and some of the larger tech companies are, are, are certainly very very strong in this trend um, I think we saw today that um, uh, uh, Amazon is is investing in four more large renewable projects worldwide uh, and 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 that is some you know that that is in the end what we need we can um, uh, if if the players in the market don't go uh, in the right direction, then um, no regulation will um, will help. So that, that that is what I find a very interesting one, and that will drive also uh, the, you know the, uh, the finding of solutions. Okay, thank you, Leonard. Uh, Harold, your positive trend. Yeah. Um, one positive trend. Uh, what I see now is that uh, the costs of CO two emissions uh, raise 
quite significantly and if they uh, and, and well hearing mr timmermans um that should raise even more uh, and also for parties coming from uh, outside of the eu uh, the products being imported in the eu there should be some extra tax so if uh, production of co2 or emission of co2 becomes more expensive then automatically the renewable energy sector becomes more attractive also with um, extra uh, costs as for instance production of hydrogen so production of renewable hydrogen hydrogen might be attractive as soon as co2 is uh, expensive now okay good one finally uh, michelle maybe your last takeaway a uh, positive trend that you're seeing that could help um, mitigate the well I, I i mean the risk that i focus on but of course the more legal risk from a legislative uh, point of view so um a positive trend that i see there uh, increasing of course is is the capacity of the sector to organize themselves and and to uh, influence the uh, policy makers decision makers by means of lobbying through the trade associations and now we have of course like Honnold solar we have uh, the dutch wind association they group together so i think um, um that's a very positive development that they're able to uh, to influence pol the policy makers to mitigate those, those legislative risks that i that i flagged Okay. Thank you, Michel Chatelain. Thank you, Leonard Flores. And thank you, Harold Hofeng, for your contributions to this uh, interesting webinar. Um, and we look forward to meeting you live at uh, the, the Dutch conference. And thank you for this afternoon. Thank you for the attendees uh, for joining. And if you have further questions, feel free to approach uh, the, the speakers of today or come and meet us at the event. I would like to thank you and wish you a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome and thank you. Bye-bye.